Let's talk about the eerie, surreal, the mysterious mundane. Um, what it means for all of fashion. How these images connect us. Kind of the dark aspects of life that everybody's trying to hide right now. And what bringing them up and uncovering them can mean for fashion and all of us in terms of art and fashion images. Okay, jump into it. Do you know those pictures? Do you know them? Just joking. Do you know those pictures on Tumblr, like on Tumblr blogs specifically, that are kind of unsettling to look at, but also really enchanting? Um, and it feels like you want to go down a rabbit hole the moment you see one of surreal, dreamlike images of people just doing really normal things to the point that it's so mundane that it feels familiar to you. You've never seen these pictures and you're pretty sure you've never seen them, but you kind of are like, but haven't I? And haven't I been in some of these pictures? Where it feels like when you're looking at the pictures on a digital camera after a pool party, with your friends and you're like oh that's so cute that's so fun but these are people you've never seen before in circumstances you've never seen before maybe people in russia in 2006 just standing outside on what looks like cctv and you're like i've never been to russia but there's something so familiar and like weird about this picture that i like and don't understand feels familiar but also feels like something i've never seen before so i need to keep seeing more pictures of it do you know what I'm talking about? If you don't, go on Tumblr, it'll come to you. In the 90s, there was a culture of fashion photography, um, several different styles, several different photographers, I'll put their names on the screen, um, who photographed work that sought to reveal the truths about certain aspects of life and living that weren't put in the mainstream um, before, because what fashion was doing was selling an idealized image of reality in order to advertise clothing, perfume, etc. And so these images sought to talk about kind of the underbelly of the fashion industry and the um, world where people were navigating addiction and other struggles, where people were doing very mundane things. Jurgen Teller's work um, in Gosi's um, shows the reality of like modeling. These young women and girls were so young, so vulnerable, so sometimes insecure, sometimes confused, like regular people, which people, all of us are, all of those things. And it helped to, rather than aggrandize these models and make them into these untouchable, massive fembots, it made them vulnerable and made them complex humans like all the rest of us. Um, so that's kind of what the tone of the photography, one of the photography styles that existed at the time was. And that was like in direct response to these like glossy high glam images, fimbots. So there is no familiarity when you're seeing like a fashion image and you're like, that is a celebrity, but they look like they're doing nothing. Or that is a model, but now she's like paired back or an actor and they're paired back to their like smallest circumstance. They're, they're in their hotel, so they're vulnerable. These are strangers. And you're like, I don't know them. But why is what they're doing so familiar and so similar to what I do and what I have done? Like, like I said, one of the examples that I like to use is Lauren Greenfield's work, um, which like can sometimes investigate like extreme, like elite culture, but also very familiar like aspects of life, like girlhood. So girls doing their makeup in the mirror. Everybody's done the makeup in the mirror with other girls pretty much. And so it feels familiar to see to the point that you're like, I love that. There, this reminds me of me. It's nostalgic in this way that it reminds me of me, but doesn't displace me so much that it feels aspirational, like something is unsettled in me and I need to start shopping and buying. It just is reminding me of the reality of my childhood, but also my reality of now. And so now I want to talk about what I think the value of these weird surrealist images are, these mundane, mysterious images are. I think what happens in these pictures is it puts people in front of something that they don't always have to confront, which is um, unresolvable reality. The unresolvable reality. You're not seeing a model that's posed and bent and contorted and edited and retouched and, um, 
constructed her body in a way that is unobtainable for most of society, um, in expensive clothes that most of society cannot afford or access, etc. You are seeing someone who feels like a mirror to you. You are seeing somebody reflect yourself to you. Persona, Ingmar Bergman. And that's hard. And I think that's what's enchanting about it. That's not something you always have to do. I don't think, I think we think from a very like egoistic perspective. And it makes sense that this aesthetic follows or is directly related to the aesthetic of decay that we saw in 2020 during lockdown, the metal drippy jewelry, the fairy grunge aesthetic, dystopian aesthetic, etc., etc. They were on the far extreme end of reminding us of a possibilities of our reality. And this grounds us in what our reality actually is. It's grotesque. It's imperfect. It's animalistic, even feral. If this person in the picture isn't smiling and kind of looks like me or is in a normal house that reminds me of my parents' house and blah, 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 blah. And this photo is from 2006 and I don't live with my parents anymore. Then I'm having to think like, where was I in 2006 with my parents and where am I now? You know what I mean? It kind of puts you in a position to contemplate the things in life that really matter, like mortality and existence and relationships and reality, you know, and what this all means. And it's kind of like this existential positioning that occurs when you're viewing these images, which is like not something you're expecting to happen when you're just on social media. That is kind of the allure of the images. It's not only that it's like this voyeuristic opportunity to see what people who are similar to you are doing, but aren't you, but it's also just like a reflection and it makes you contemplate, you know, the things around you, the things in you, your relationships, without being so aspirational that it makes you feel like you have to completely change your life and go out and start shopping and, you know, undermine all the things that you already have. It kind of just makes you evaluate them. That's why I like it. And um, that's what I think connects it to the fashion industry right now. I think that the reason why they circulate on Tumblr um, and other niche subcultural fashion spaces is because of the objective of Tumblr. So I want to talk about the objectives of different platforms and why this seems to thrive so much um, on Tumblr. It also used to thrive on Instagram, but we'll talk about it. So I think all platforms in terms of social media have different objectives. I think we can probably agree that most platforms are centered on signaling status, perfectionism, um, winning and achievement, success, social belonging and popularity. That's my allegation. That's my opinion. That's what I think. I think all social media platform is about success and winning popularity because they all demonstrate your success and popularity on your account as if it's important. How many people follow you and engage your content? Um, certain platforms will show you the analytics of each tweet. Uh, to the point that they're showing how many people have viewed the tweet versus how many people have liked it. So they're literally showing your, uh, making your analytics as visible as humanly possible. You are this successful. And that constructs the way that people engage your platform. Are you a person who gets a lot of likes relative to views? Are you a person who has a lot of followers? What kind of people follow you? Oh, I follow the celebrity, they follow you. It'll show me that, you know what I mean? These things create status. Um, and allow people to be at the top of hierarchies and things like that in order to obtain social blogging. Whereas on Tumblr, Tumblr is a unique social media platform because it's a microblogging site where your following is secret actually. It's hidden to the outside world how many people follow you and engagement on Tumblr doesn't necessarily mean that you've effectively garnered an audience because of the tagging system on Tumblr where you can post an image and put the hashtag Bella Hadid or some other celebrity figure, it is very likely that the image will circulate a lot. It doesn't mean that you have a lot of followers. So you have to establish yourself in terms of identity well. That's your job on Tumblr. On other platforms, I think it's more important to establish yourself in terms of visibility. And I think on Tumblr, it's a lot more important to establish yourself in terms of identity and effectively cultivating identity in a way that is strategic and communicates who you are and what you're trying to say um, in a way that's cool to people and interesting. To the extent that sometimes people would have seven, 10, five separate Tumblr, Tumblr blogs that all sought to communicate different 
things like certain different aesthetics or different values or had different purposes because they had to maintain them separately in order to effectively establish and cultivate identity. On other platforms, you just do it all on one page, right? You have your feed and people can look at your feed and understand what you think, what you like, what your values are. Tumblr is very, very centered on identity in this unique way and so that's why. Another example of this on social media though is iPhone blogging and Instagram blogs. In the 2010s on Tumblr, having an Instagram blog was like really popular. The one that people brought up most often um, was Unflavored Waxed Floss on Tumblr and it was a blog where a person or maybe a group of people, very often these were run by collectives of creative people, but they would pull from Instagram these kind of similar eerily surreal photos of kind of mundane nothingness and then arrange them very artistically on a blog from complete strangers, different Instagrams, uh, in this very artistic way, like they were curating an art gallery um, in order to communicate a certain aesthetic that was like uh, unexplainable. And I think that it did the same thing. It was kind of unifying in how mundane it was and how universal the images were and how they could be arranged in this artful way uh, that was like, it did feel like being in an art gallery where you're just looking at something and it's causing you to introspect and think about what it could all mean in a way that like you don't get as much leeway to do when you have these very stylized images telling you exactly what to think. The model is hot, beautiful, and they have something you don't is what you see when you see a really stylized image. When you see these really paired back mundane images of everyday life, you're like, wait, what? Who am I? And who are you? And that's kind of what I like about them. Um, and then the example of iPhone blog, reflect the aesthetic identity of your blog next to runway show images. That's your main blog. And then your iPhone blog would be the pictures that you take on your phone when you roam around the world of just random things you're doing. Hanging out with your friends, going to a DJ set, um, eating breakfast, eating dinner. You take a picture, you put it on that blog without very many cares. And that's a way of establishing your external identity outside of um, your main blog. And again, I think the thing that was so grounding about those uh, iPhone blogs is it reminded people of themselves. You're just seeing somebody who you maybe put on a pedestal on the blogging sphere because of their effective, their amazing ability to effectively cultivate identity, like with their main blog. You're like, oh, that's the insights to their life. And it sometimes very often would like reflect kind of. But I think that that's connected to what's going on in the fashion industry because like I said, it is unifying in its mundaneness looks like you're looking at a photograph of your own memory. Um, it's so surreal and so enchanting. The reason why I bring it up is I think that there's a split and a shift historically in internet culture where a lot of online platforms did used to revolve around what you could create and how you would establish identity through what you create. Photo Bucket, for example, is a photo uploading website uh, that allow people to cultivate identity online based on their actual lives. You take pictures with your digital camera in the mid 2000s when digital camera culture was booming and then you upload them to your photo bucket. I do have to interrupt myself though and say that even on photo bucket in the mid 2000s there was a growing culture of using outside images again of fashion photos, runway photos, designer pictures, pictures from Flickr in order to establish identity on photo bucket as well but it was very often more cutting edge people like people who ran layout sites or other online customization platforms, um, queer people, women, girls, like it was much more uh, cutting edge in terms of like internet culture to be able to do that, to bring outside photos onto another platform in order to cultivate identity. And then maybe you would give somebody your photo bucket password or show them what your photo bucket looked like to be like, this is, these are the kind of photos that I've captured like Pokemon. It's very similar, I think, to Visco um, nowadays, but I do think that there's been a split and shift in social media in terms of people using outside images in order to establish identity. So whereas it was photo bucket, Visco, Flickr, etc or even your myspace photos there still was a shift or a split on myspace where in terms of like layout making you could use pictures from the internet or magazines in order to establish identity and to communicate exactly who you were so photos of like sneakers or pop culture events or designer name brands those were really popular um, or even like your sidekick or other like pre-smartphone <laughs> phone backgrounds, you would do these things in order to establish identity or having like a ringtone, a certain song. These things were like ways of using outside media in order to establish your identity. And I think that we're kind of used to that by now. Like sometimes people will post photo dumps and use 
runway pictures or memes that they didn't create. Um, but again, I think a lot of social media or even just like online platforms did revolve around like what you could create in order to cultivate identity. And I think that like the iPhone blog culture um, booming is like a return to mid 2000s cultural sensibilities around like cultivating identity online. Because it reminds us of things that matter. So I'm going to start talking about how this is all connected to the fashion industry. It's the trick of the eye. I don't usually introduce sections, but I can see how this part gets confusing because as I'm editing, I'm getting a little confused. But this part I start talking about trick of the eye as a sartorial tool in fashion um, as a design statement and how that relates to relational meaning in fashion. So the reason why I bring up trick of the eye is because in my opinion, it works to undermine the fashion system or at least allow us to interrogate the fashion system and how we use and wear clothes every day. And that's what I think the mysterious mundane and eerie surreal does. It makes us question why we're so used to seeing like commercial images that are so highly stylized that trick us into only thinking about consuming um, on a hamster wheel um, and it relates us back to ourselves. And that's what I think trick of the eye does because it makes us think, okay, if these are all arbitrary symbols that can be completely reconstructed and reconfigured in a different way, we all made, we made this all up. So now we can focus on things that are more important, but it takes me a bit to get to the point. This is a theme that's really commonly used in fashion. It's being used more and more on the runway this past few seasons to the point that it's trickled down to Zara um, and fast fashion companies. Okay, so trompe l'oeil is not about questioning your reality or bending and blurring of artificial and legitimate, but it's also about questioning symbolic meaning in general and what symbols mean in our world, especially in terms of fashion um, and clothing and structure. And it's about the relational meanings that exist. And an example that I'm going to get to later in more detail would be when you see a runway show where they have pants um, painted on a skirt. It makes you think about what is what are pants and what is a skirt and what is the clothing and fashion system and what are our standards and codes for getting dressed and why is this um, so exciting and riveting to see and why is this not common. And what, are, what do the distinctions mean between these things? Okay, in terms of high fashion, I do think that some of these brands have a larger purpose. I think that fast fashion is reflecting the larger purposes of the uh, high fashion brand. One of the things that the House of Margiela does is they do artisanal collections where garments are made from secondhand garments. It kind of works to interrogate the fashion system entirely and what it means to have a process of constructing clothes. An example is in spring 1996, they do this trick of the eye where they use these photo photocopied looking um, garments. You're investigating the process of making clothes, the process of getting dressed, and you contemplate how many purposes each garment actually has, which means what is each symbol and what, do, what does each symbol mean and why are we spending time thinking about how to signal status and use these symbols to exchange meaning when they can be undermined and seen as arbitrary in all these different ways so this way we can focus on more meaningful uh, connective things like relationships. So it creates this self-reflective relationship with engaging the fashion system where you're not even just interrogating fashion system you're interrogating your relationship with it and yourself okay and then in terms of reality blurring with the surreal Ru Yi on TikTok was suggesting and I think these videos are like comedic but I really really like them suggesting that it's like connected to the distrust that we have with images that we see on a daily basis as it relates to artificial intelligence and like the growing trend of AI fashion images which I like to say more and more it's concerning me Every day on Twitter, there is a virally circulating artificial intelligence image that just isn't true, isn't real, and people keep trying to pass them off as real, like the image of the 19 black men in the 1970s, and it's an AI generated image that's so dangerous, and people keep doing it for like virality and clout without understanding like the horrible, horrible implications of circulating untrue images. 
it's why surrealism is a growing theme because I think people are interested in like the ambiguity of reality just as they're interested in the ambiguity of status um, especially with the internet the democratization of everything on the internet to me was like the easiest indicator that we were going to push further and further into um, this culture of reality blurring so what they're suggesting is essentially that perhaps it's done to get the public to distrust images uh, tricks of the eye, visual deception, the transformative ability of works of art, the power of seeing something online um, exclusively as the primary form of interpreting it, right? And so I think that the, this concept of reality blurring like perpetuates. I think the conclusion of the optical illusion section is that optical illusions in fashion allow us to contemplate the meaning of symbols in fashion and the purpose of those symbols and their arbitrary nature, which makes us question our processes of consuming, including consuming fashion images. And that's why I related it to AI generated art images, which focus especially on production and consumption rather than on expression humanity, connectivity, presence, they have a similar power to ground us in their relational nature, in my opinion, optical illusion fashion has that similar power. And it's like normal clothes versus optical illusions in fashion. And then the mysterious mundane versus highly stylized fashion images. There are parallels in terms of their relational power and their grounding ability. The mundane images circulating in the subcultural fashion spaces and art spaces make it so that we're thinking about things that are not like um, connected to the immortality that I talked about on TikTok. Hopefully I can link the video, but I have a video on TikTok where I talk about how I like art and I like fashion because it makes me and a lot of people feel immortal because it makes it seem like there's distinction between ourselves and nature. And maybe that's not good, but it is what it is. It makes it feel like when you see somebody who is perfected or looks artificial like a robot or um, has the skill to transform a human body into something beautiful and artful, it makes it feel like we are different than like a worm or a monkey because we have this special ability to do that. It makes it feel like there is a reason and purpose for us to be here, right? That there is, this existence is not, is this, what? This existence is not futile and there's a point and that there's something higher and that it connects us all, right? That's what art I think does. That's why I love art. It's like religious. It's like a spiritual transcendent experience, art and fashion and expressions through art and fashion. And I think that what the mysterious mundane does is grounds us and makes us realize that mortality is inevitable <laughs> and that nature is inevitable. And if we were confronted with nature more often, I think we would be more grounded, which brings me to the next point, which is grounding. The beneficial, beautiful um, summation of all of this is that it's grounding. The mysterious mundane aesthetic, hashtag aesthetic, is grounding. And it reminds us that life is simultaneously pleasurable and painful. That life is full of range. It reminds us of the multiplicity of life. When you're just seeing like these artificial aspirational images that you know are not achievable, it can trick you into thinking like, this goes forever. There's a way to perfect until we can't feel pain. There's something to yearn for. There's a thing to buy when you buy this top, when you shop this way, when you become clean girl aesthetic, then everything gets pure and whole and holy and everything comes together and you're, you live your life and your dreams come true or whatever I said in the other video, you know? And you're a perfect doll and you're magic and you're Barbie and your dreams come true. And that's not life. Life is painful. Everybody will experience loss. Everybody will experience pain. Everybody will experience happiness, joy, and love, right? Magic even and things like that. And I think that that's what the mysterious mundane reminds us. That's why it's so grounding and that's why it's so quote unquote universal. I'm talking about like a really niche <laughs> subcultural online space that like almost 100% of the population has no idea about, but I'm like, it's universal, bud. It's universal, you know? Okay, now let's connect this. Since I haven't talked enough, the camera has died three times. Let's connect this to <laughs> specific fashion design. Okay, and so I think that this is also connected to a general shift that fashion has taken to reflect what goes on on the streets 
and in real life, whether that's at Martine Rose, Bottega, Prada, Miu Miu, etc. These reflections of what people are actually wearing and actually doing and making practical wearable clothes, doing windswept hair on the runway, workers clothes on the runway at Prada, creating these very casual uh, garments in these luxury fabrics at Bottega, Martine Rose uh, doing the exactitudes, Heaven by Marc Jacobs even actually doing <laughs> exactitudes photography. I think this shift that fashion has made is a reflection of the mysterious mundane because it is again this reflection reflects back to us the things that are most important. Again, relationships, the things that connect us, humanity, um, the things that are uniting about all of this. Like when you see somebody on the runway, ouch, oh my god, when you see some of these looks on the runway and they, um, cause you to pause and have to focus on attention to detail and kind of the more uh, mundane forms of dressing. Uh, this is actually something <laughs> Layden said today about the Kendall Jenner ads. Um, it, it causes you to actually pause and think about what's going on in the image and why, rather than just being sold some dream, some aspirational dream that you know you can never attain or achieve. I think it's good <laughs> because of the ways that it unites us in the same way that um, the weird surrealist images unite us. The the unspoken uh, allure of voyeurism, for example, the unspoken allure of voyeurism and getting insight into other people's lives, the unspoken allure of identifying with other people and having uh, mundane aspects of people's lives reflected back to you, or even sad aspects of people's lives reflected back to you, and how people kind of want that and don't know how to explain that that's what they want. That's what people are ca like call like relatability. That's what people pretended to want from the authentic marketing era. You want the, the connective aspects of humanity. I watched a video today about how in the lockdown era there was a study that showed people felt less lonely when they could do Zoom meeting, um, like game nights with people than they do now that we're not in lockdown and they have to actually like cultivate friendships and foster those friendships and put themselves out there and that the impact that it's had on people in terms of them, their personalities changing after lockdown is what usually would happen in a 10 year span. It's been shortened to, from the lockdown to now, people's personalities have completely changed. They're completely closed off. They're scared to interact with other people. And they just generally have had these shifts in identity where um, they're just not as connected anymore. And what connected these people, I think like what con connects you to people when you're doing like a Zoom game night and like what makes you feel less lonely is directly connected to the eerie surreal, the mysterious, mundane. It's human connectivity. It's relationships. Whether people want to like acknowledge that or not, I think that that's what people are missing. And I think that that's why this shift has happened in fashion, because that is what people want. I don't think people realize what they're missing is community, is um, connectivity, is identifying with other humans and the impact that that can have on your brain. But I think that that's what it is. I think it's connection. And I think that that's what this brings about. That's what like universal things do. That's what not aspiring to be different than what you actually are can do. I guess I have to wrap it up because my camera's going to die for the third time. And I feel like I've said what I needed to say. But yeah, that's, that's what I think. And we'll, we'll grow on that. We'll expand on that. Let us know. It might be a pleasure. Okay, slay. All right. I feel like that made sense. Peace and love.